next speaker and the last speaker of the session is uh, Dr. Paolo uh, Ferro, and he'll speak to us on fracture base of the fifth metatarsal fractures. Thank you. Good morning. So I'll be discussing the base of fifth metatarsal fractures. Uh, it's a fracture often debated as to what is a Jones, what is a pseudo Jones, and what's the best management. So I'll give you my approach to these fractures. So first of all, first of all, the classification. So there's three zones: the zone one, so-called the tuberosity avulsion fracture; zone two, the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction Jones. This is going automatically. I don't know why. Um, metaphyseal diaphyseal uh, Jones fracture. Then zone three is the diaphyseal. Uh, so-called stress fracture. Now, if you look at the anatomy, there's a couple of strong tendons, uh, tight ligaments, and even uh, complex blood supply to the area, and that's why this so-called small bone has to be classified into different zones, which um, helps uh, manage the fracture appropriately. So, first of all, these are patients who present with a history of either twisting their ankle or their foot, and now they can't bear weight on the foot, they've got significant pain of the lateral border, and there's often bruising and swelling along the proximal third of the fifth metatarsal. These are best diagnosed on uh, foot x-rays, AP lateral and oblique. Often they are painful and they can't weight bear. And actually this is one of the rare indications for doing non-weight bearing x-rays with the foot slightly plantar flexed, as you can see the fracture easier. CT scan is limited to suspected non-unions and MRI, MRI and bone scan only used if uh, suspecting a stress fracture in an athlete with, during the prodromal phase. So first is zone one, so-called tuberosity avulsion fracture. This accounts for 90% of these base of fifth metatarsal fractures, uh, also known as the dancer's fracture, commonly seen in ballet dancers. And by definition, this is a fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal that extends into the uh, metatarsal cuboid joint. So if we look at the anatomy, first of all, the blood supply, we've got fantastic metaphyseal arteries to this area, so it's a well-vascularized area of the bone. Uh, Originally, it was thought that it was the peroneus brevis that evolved the tuberosity causing the fracture, but uh, subsequent anatomical studies show that it's actually the um, lateral branch of the plantar fascia which evolves it. So management being well vascularized, these fractures do very well with conservative management. Uh, my protocol is non-weight bearing in a cast for three weeks. The only reason that they're non-weight bearing at this stage is to treat the swelling and the pain. If you can get them weight bearing sooner, the better. But by three weeks, they should be weight bearing either in the cast or the boot. At six weeks, they can transition into cross trainers and they can resume sport once they're symptom free. And the reason for this is that in the literature, we've found that the most significant predictor of poor outcomes with these fractures is the longer you keep them non-weight bearing. So it's shown the sooner they start weight bearing, the sooner this unites, the better function you get. There are some limited indications for surgery, so significant displacement at the fracture site. The literature says anything between three and five millimeters. A significant step off if you're at the metatarsal cuboid um, articulation, and if you develop a painful non-union. So fixation options, either screw fixation or tension band wiring. I personally prefer tension band wiring. It's often a small fragment. You try and put a screw there, you fracture that proximal fragment, and there you lose your fixation. So this was a case of a patient who had a significantly displaced fracture, which I fixed with tension band wiring, and you can see they unite very nicely. So the only real complication is non-unions. The majority of the non-unions are pain-free. If you do get a painful non-union, look at where exactly the fracture line is. So if it's extra articulus, not involving the metatarsal cuboid joint, just excise the fragment and reattach the peroneus brevis. If it is an intra-articular, unfortunately, you have to uh, fix the so yeah, we have a young lady presented in 2012. Uh, she had a previous fixation of this avulsion injury, which unfortunately went into a non-union. So first of all, know your surface anatomy. Foot surgery is all about surface anatomy. If you know your surface anatomy, you can approach most things safely. Now, because you have to expose this, the fracture site because it's non-union, you need to make your incision over the fifth metatarsal. Be careful as you go through the skin, the sural nerve is always there. So look for it, keep it out the way. Next, you've got to, once you've exposed the bone, identify the, the non-union, either with your blade or using sharp osteotomes. Once it's identified, use curettes and osteotomes to uh, clean out the fracture site. Uh, once the fracture site is clean, I, I like using a 2mm drill bit and perforate both uh, fracture surfaces. This is important as it brings uh, marrow elements into the fracture site, which helps with union. Next, you've got to bone graft these non-unions. I like using uh, autograft from the ipsilateral ankle, but whatever you're comfortable with, you can use. And then I finally fixed it with tension band wiring. She actually followed up three years later to see if she had to have these wires removed, and she's united well with, and pain-free. Next, we get the zone two, the so-called Jones fracture. 
and it's called the Jones fracture because it was first described by Sir Robert Jones in 1902. He published a paper of seven base of fifth metatarsal fractures, of which the first x-ray was his own foot, which he broke while dancing around a maypole at one of the military uh, garden parties. So by definition, this is a, a fracture of the uh, fifth metatarsal at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, and the fracture line must enter the 4-5 intermetatarsal joint. Nunley showed that these fractures are on average 15 to 20 millimeters proximal to, to the tuberosity. So if we look at the mechanism, this 4-5 intermetatarsal joint has actually got very strong ligaments and it's quite rigid. Now if you apply any vertical or lateral force to the head of the metatarsal, it forms a fulcrum which then results in the fracture through this um, rigid uh, intermetatarsal joint. And next, the problem is that you've got this peroneus tertius giving a torsional force and peroneus brevis a tractional force. And this is the first problem with these fractures and why they're so uh, difficult to treat. The next is, is the blood supply to the area. It's been shown that this 4-5 intermetatarsal area is a, has a watershed blood supply. Some great uh, anatomical studies have been done and they show that on the uh, medial side, your blood supply comes from the periosteal uh, blood flow and laterally from a nutrient artery which enters retrograde. So if it fractures there, unfortunately you're going to get area of avascularity. So not ideal to treat these patients non-operatively, but if you've got your low demand elderly patient or someone with comorbidities, then if you do treat them non-operatively, it has to be in a plaster cast, and unlike the type 1, they have to be non-weight bearing, at least 6 to 8 weeks. Following this, they need to go into a boot, and you have to be in the boot until you get radiographic union, and this is where the problem comes. So Clapper showed that uh, in 25 Jones fractions at the Naval Academy, they had only a 72% union with an average time to union of uh, 21 weeks. And this was confirmed by Zogby, who had who looked at 10 Jones fractures and had an average time to union of 22 weeks. Now, if you're an active working adult, this unfortunately is too long to be off. So these fractures are best treated operatively, and especially if you've got a non-union or refracture. Now, fixation methods, you can either do tension band wiring, plate fixation, or screws. I personally feel that screw fixation is the best for the acute Jones fracture. Um, until recently, we kind of only had these screws available, and what you want to do is try and put the thickest screw down the shaft, which is safe without fracturing it, and also try and use a solid screw. Um, the guys at Ohio have shown that uh, cannulated screws fail at about 100,000 cyclics of load, whereas um, solid screws over 2 million uh, cycles of load didn't fracture. And now companies are bringing so-called Jones-specific uh, screw systems, and basically what it is, you've got a cannulated preparation system, so you have a K-wire, which you place down the shaft, make sure you've got good positioning, you prepare with cannulated drills and taps, and then on the set there's different, si <coughs> sorry, different size screws, which you then uh, put after you've removed the K-wire. So yeah, we have a classic Jones fracture and a young active patient. The procedure is a percutaneous type of insertion, so once again, mark out your anatomy, but your incision is about a centimeter and a half proximal and dorsal to the tip of the styloid. Once you've made your incision, once again, sural nerve, nine out of 10 times, is just underneath, underneath the skin. So look, look out for it, get it out the way, and also try and dissect around your peroneus brevis, because your drills and stuff can damage it. And this is kind of the success to your procedure, is placement of your K-wire. If you get this right, the rest is pretty easy. And everybody talks of this high and inside technique, and basically what you're looking at, if you look at on the AP, the axis of the medulla is slightly medial to the tuberosity. And on the lateral, one again, once again, the axis of the, of the medulla crinelle is slightly dorsal. So you're basically looking at the dorsal medial entry point, as shown here in this model. So here I've placed the KY, both an always check AP lateral, I mean standard protocol when doing x-rays, and make sure that your KY is going down the middle of the shaft, and you can see that's the so-called high and inside placement. The, if you do use a tuberosity, guaranteed you're going to perforate the medial cortex, you're going to give yourself a stress riser, and you're going to have problems. Next is to measure your screw length. If you're using a partially threaded screw, all you need to do is to get those, those threads across the fracture site. Remember, this is a curved bone. If you put too long a screw, you're going to end up distracting your fracture site. You then prepare the, the, the entry with, what, with whatever system you're using, if it's a cannulated system like this. Next, you start putting your screws. Unfortunately, at this time, I only had a 5.5 cannulated. The new systems went out, so I used the cannulated screw. And what's, what's important here is that you've got to make sure that you put the thickest screw possible without breaking the metatarsal. And actually, they say as soon as you engage the distal um, uh, fragment, you should actually see the metatarsal head twist as you tighten the screw. And basically, this will be your 
end result. So post-operatively, the patients, I've placed them non-weight bearing in a cast for four to six weeks. The Americans will allow them to weight bear at two weeks. I'm a little bit more cautious. They then can go full weight bearing in the boot at four or six weeks, start some physio. They can start putting shoes on at about eight to 10 and resume sport once they've got radiographic union. This has been shown in literature, it can take up to about 12 weeks. And the important thing has also been shown, unless there's indication, leave that screw for life. One of the highest uh, risks for refracture is removal of hardware. So complications, intraoperatively you can get iatrogenic fractures, you try and put too thick a screw, fracturing the, the metatarsal, you can get sural nerve injury, peroneal tendon injuries, infection, and later you can get refracture or non-unions. Here we have a, a case of a previously operated Jones fracture which developed a non-union on CT scan. So these, unfortunately, you, have to, you can't treat these percutaneously, you have to open it up, remove the hardware, clean out the fracture site, and you have to open up that medullary canal if you want uh, this to unite. You then graft it with a dogenous bone, and in my preference, if there's been previous fixation has uh, failed, I'll then use a, a hook plate. Also, try and find out why this failed. Vitamin D, very important. The literature is showing, multiple studies showing um, high incidence of low vitamin D in fifth metatarsal fractures, even in professional soccer players who are theoretically exposed to the sun. Other thing is, look for malalignment. In this case, the patient had a hind foot varus, which we then had to address at the time of surgery. So we did a Dwyer osteotomy, cleaned out the, the non-union, bone grafted, and put a plate fixation. Finally, in zone three, so-called stress fractures. By definition, this is a fracture which is distal to the four or five intermetatarsal joint, mainly seen in, in athletes, and it's due to repetitive stress, often early in the season when the guys are trying to get, regain their fitness quickly. And um, often they give you a history of some prodromal pain along the lateral border prior to the fracture. So causes either mechanical, so it's overuse, but don't forget about malalignment issues, and also don't forget biology again. Vitamin D has been shown to have high incidence in these fractures, as well as hormon hormonal um, abnormalities. So these fractures are then further subdivided by TORG, so as to guide us with regards to management. So your TORG type 1 is a so-called acute fracture. This is where your, your fracture line is still sharp margins, there's no widening, there's no medullary sclerosis or periosteal bone reaction at this stage. These do very well with conservative management, put them in a cast for six to eight weeks, and they usually unite. The type two TORGs, that's so-called delayed union. Yeah, you start seeing some widening at the fracture site. This is from bone resorption. You start seeing some medullary sclerosis and periosteal bone fix, uh, formation. These you can treat like a Jones. Percutaneous screw fixation works well. And then finally, the type threes, which is the so-called non-union. Yeah, you've got significant widening at the fracture site, and actually your medullary canal gets obliterated with sclerosis. So there's actually no blood in that area at all. Uh, these you have to treat like non-unions in your Jones. You've got to open it up, to bride it, open up that medullary canal, graft, and then fixate. Again, for these cases, I prefer plate fixation. In the stress fractures, as I mentioned, always look for malalignment. If there is, correct it. Whether it's a Dwyer osteotomy, elevation of the first, look at what's causing your malalignment and correct it. But be very cautious in your elite athletes. You realign an elite athlete's foot, that's it, his career is over. So in those cases, fix it and try and use orthotics. If that fails, either way, he, you've given him a chance. Then what's showing promising results is actually shockwave therapy. Uh, Faria looked at comparing shockwave with uh, screw fixation of these um, stress fractures. Similar fusion rates, but what was interesting is far less complications. And Moretti looked at um, talk type 2's uh, stress fractures in professional soccer players, 100% union at eight weeks. So something to consider in your treatment protocol. So in summary, your zone one evulsion fractures, early weight bearing in a cast, they do well. Your Jones fractures, percutaneous screw fixation. Uh, zone three, according to the talk type, so type one, non-weight bearing in a cast. Type two, percutaneous screw fixation. And type three, you have to open, openly debride the fracture, bone graft, and fixate. And finally, I'd say thank you, and I invite everybody here to please join us next year at the ninth uh, biennial CEF uh, Congress. We have fantastic speakers coming out. Mark Easley, who's now the previous AFAS uh, president, Hans Trunke, Pascal Repstein, Stefan Ramel, these guys are all super specialists in different fields of foot and ankle surgery. It will be an excellent meeting to attend. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the speakers. I think it's been a wonderful session. I apologize to the little people doctors um, for being running a little bit late and therefore we won't have questions. But I'm sure all the speakers will be available at lunchtime for you to ask them uh, pertinent questions. Thank you again to everyone. Um
We'll see you in May at our meeting, the biannual meeting in Johannesburg.